vampires are a staple in horror fiction the world over. The charismatic lady killer or seductive succubi biting necks and sucking the blood of their victims as they sleep. Equally popular in pop culture as they are to horror fans poring over black and white B-movies, the character of the vampire holds universal appeal and to most, even those not usually prone to scepticism, remain completely fictional. How can we explain then the old folk stories stated squarely and insistently as fact that vampires risen from the dead stalked townsfolk and terrorised entire villages at night? Stranger still that remains excavated in Bulgaria, Slovakia and right across Europe, staked into their coffins with iron nails, teeth removed and bricks forced into their gaping mouths have been found in their hundreds providing compelling evidence for said tales. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. The image that jumps into your mind when someone mentions vampires will most likely differ wildly depending on your age and location. From the disturbing Count Orlock or the middle-aged pale-faced seducers of Hammer films to the high school catalogue models of Twilight, Literature and popular culture has shaped what we imagine of a vampire for centuries. Far from the rotting plague bringers of medieval Bulgaria or the demon goddesses in ancient mythology, in the West and increasingly throughout the world, we're faced instead with numerous affluent, well-dressed vampires waiting to hunt prey at night or pop into the nail salon for a quick manicure by day. Before we dig too deeply on the long and grim history of vampires in the real world, it's important to understand the distinction between what we expect of a vampire today versus the blight-infested monsters of folklore, and more disturbingly, the reality of the Middle Ages and beyond. It is often stated that the first work of pure fiction to include a vampire in its pages is that of an Anglo-Saxon poem entitled the Vampire of the Fens, dating from the 11th century. There is, however, some who claim that the work doesn't actually exist at all. Proving to be incredibly elusive as it does, it's hard to argue. As to why or when this poem became a popular misconception is unknown, equally for what reason. It was not until 400 years later in the 15th century that a literary character would appear in a fictional tale with the tendencies that one would call vampiric. Brian J. Frost, in his book The Monster with a Thousand Faces, Guises of the Vampire in Myth and Folklore, traces the next fictional work to be that of Sir Thomas Mallory with his tale of Le Mort d'Arte. Published in 1485, it is a Middle English retelling of the classic King Arthur tale. However, Frost himself notes that it is a tenuous link with only a single side character, a queen who drinks the blood of virgins to sustain her life. No other activities associated with the law of vampires is mentioned. After this, there was another long 300 year hiatus in fiction of the stalking, blood sucking monster. It was in the 18th century, after a vampire boom in popular folklore, that the popular work of Heinrich Ossenfelder's De Vampire was published in 1748. This poem is widely accepted as introducing the popular concept of the modern vampire into European literature. The second verse introduces common themes as such. And as softly thou art sleeping, to thee shall I come creeping, and thy life's blood drain away. In 1819, The Vampire, a short work of fiction written by John William Polidori was published. Described by British writer Christopher Frayling as the first story successfully to fuse the disparate elements of vampirism into a coherent literary genre. It tells the tale of Lord Ruthven, a suave and sophisticated nobleman, and elevated the vampire character out of the villages where it once stalked, rotten and disease-risen, to the affluent and educated killer, enjoying the rank of high society that it has retained almost exclusively since. Lord Ruthven mysteriously enters London society where he seduces a young woman, marries her and then promptly sucks her body dry of blood and disappears into the night. 
In 1847, James Malcolm Rymer, writing in a serialised format and released in weekly pamphlets known as Penny Dreadfuls, introduced Barney the Vampire to the literary world alongside many tropes now staples of our imaginations of the vampire. Sir Francis Barney was the first vampire in fiction to sport sharp fangs when he takes the life of a young woman and, with a plunge, he seizes her neck in his fang-like teeth. Sir Francis Varney also based his traits such as superhuman strength and of immortality, with his estimated age being placed around 200 years old. He also suffers death several times throughout the story, but is always able to reanimate. He stalks women at night, creeping through their windows to bite them, leaving behind puncture wounds, and has the ability of turning others into vampires which he demonstrates when he savages a female member of a family he is terrorising by biting her simply for revenge. Alongside all of these now instantly recognisable characteristics, Varney is also the first literary vampire who cannot stand his condition, but lives as a slave to what he has become. The sympathetic vampire as it was later known. It was in Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu's gothic novella, Carmilla, again first published in serial format in 1871, that introduced a vampire that possessed a dark, seductive and over-morbid sexuality. The main character was a female vampire using the false name of Carmilla, though she was in fact, as was now becoming the standard, from high society and known as the Countess Karnstein. Carmilla slept in a coffin and stalked around in the shadows with nocturnal habits where she was able to transform into a black cat. She had unnatural beauty and preyed exclusively on young women. The story is narrated by her close friend and has, for the time, overt sexual overtones suggesting a lesbian romance between the two characters. Carmilla supplied vampires in fiction with another of its now core themes elevating further from affluent high society to the seductive, sexualized undead that instill both fear and fascination among their victims and readers alike, and a trait that would be exploited in both literature and film and made into a central point in numerous exploitation and B-movies right up until the present day. There are many that suggest outright that Lefanu's tale was a direct influence on the genre's undoubtedly most famous of tales, predating it by 26 years. That of one Abraham Stoker, or Bram Stoker for short, known the world over as Dracula. Dracula, first published in 1897, has been reimagined on stage and screen the world over and has enjoyed bestseller status since its release. The lasting legacy of Stoker was his incarnation of Dracula as the definitive vampire in fiction and the cementing of an image in our minds when we first hear the word vampire. From the Universal Studios films of the 1930s and 40s through the output of the Hammer films in the 50s, 60s and 70s, when we see vampires on screen as Monster of the Week in The X-Files, in Buffy, Interview of the Vampire or even more recently with Twilight, all stem directly and take great influence from Stoker's portrayal of the vampire. There are, however, older stories of vampires. Leaving the realm of fiction, we should leave also this perceived image of the vampire and enter into a darker world of folklore and mythology, where the lines between reality and fiction become increasingly difficult to distinguish. In his book, From Demons to Dracula, The Creation of the Modern Vampire Myth, Matthew Beresford wrote, There are clear foundations for the vampire in the ancient world, and it is impossible to prove when the myth first arose. There are suggestions that the vampire was born out of sorcery in ancient Egypt, a demon summoned into this world from some other. In folklore around the world and throughout cultures and history, we can see shadows of what we consider a vampire today, shaped by literature and cinema. Through legends and myths, there have long been tales of nocturnal beasts, blood-sucking undead and plague-bringing revenants that rise up from their graves to terrorise the living in almost all corners of every society.
As far back as ancient Mesopotamian mythology, we can find Lamashtu, the daughter of the sky god Anu. Lamashtu was a demon and malevolent goddess who would kidnap children whilst they were breastfeeding, gnawing on their bones and sucking their blood. She would eat men, drink their blood, terrorise people in their sleep and bring sickness and disease to crops and people alike. In ancient Greece, Lamia would seduce men and drink their blood, and later the Vrykolokos, undead beings risen from the dead. It was told they would roam the lands, ruddy and gorged with blood, bringing sickness and death. They would sit atop people in their sleep, suffocating them, drink blood and at times grow wolf-like fangs. In Mayan mythology, Kamazots were death bats associated with the night, death and sacrifices. And in Aboriginal folklore, the Yaramayahu were little red men who would wait in trees for unsuspecting victims and then using suckers on its hands and feet, attach themselves to their prey and drain their blood. In the Philippines, the Aswang are the shape-shifting demon dating as far back as the 16th century that are shy and elusive at night changing into animals such as bats and black dogs. They move silently, stalking prey throughout the night, eating unborn children and bring sickness to victims leading to death. The Aswang then returns to steal the bodies of the dead for sustenance. The Changxi of China are vicious reanimated corpses or undead demons with red eyes and fangs that tear their victims to shreds before feeding on their blood. They can turn to vapour or mist and have the ability to gain the power of flight through the draining of their victim's chi. By daytime they rest in caves or in their coffins, only leaving them at night to hunt for the souls of their victims. The myths and legends are so numerous that it seems like we can find a regional example of an evil undead with vampiric associations anywhere we choose to look. Whilst they do have deviations and differences, the similarities are striking. All have nocturnal tendencies, supernatural abilities and feast on the blood of the living whilst bringing plague, sickness or death to their communities. In the year 1047, the words Upilichi were written in a document describing a Russian prince and directly translated mean wicked vampire in Russian, Czech and Slovakian. This is possibly the earliest reference we have to vampires by name. In Eastern Europe, these vampires are ultimately as varied as the creatures before, but in general were not handsome seducers. They were ruddy-skinned revenants that crept through villages at night, bringing sickness and plague and foul odours. They ate children and drunk blood to gain life force in order to become a full human form again. Of course, these creatures are all myths, legends and folklore, the embodiments of evil in a campfire story or twisted demigods of ancient mythology. The lines, however, can often blur between fact and fiction when a myth takes hold and grips tight within a culture of fear. In 1921, in the small coastal village of St Osith in Essex, England, Mr. Charles Brooker, the owner of a house on Mill Street, was carrying out some building work in his garden when his shovel, thrust into the ground, hit something hard. Upon investigation, he discovered what looked to be a pelvic bone and after clearing the dirt around it, found two full skeletons lying in a row, head to foot. Unusually, the bones had been nailed down at every joint with heavy iron nails. With the village's history relating so strongly with the witch trials of 1582, people were quick to jump to the conclusion that it was the remains of Ursula Kemp, a woman who had been tried and hanged as a witch in 1582. Years later, in 2002, it was discovered that the remains were in fact those of a young man in his early 20s, somewhat damning the witch hypothesis. Despite this, however, it's still often written of as the remains of Ursula Kemp and the misconception seems unstoppable at this point. Throughout history, evidence of such burials have been discovered showing similar practices. In some cases, rocks or heavy objects were placed on the bodies and in others, spikes, stakes and heavy nails were driven through the remains, pinning it to the burial site. 
An important aspect, as we shall see, lies in the folklore throughout Europe that tells of iron having magical properties. Specifically in reference to vampire lore, the Eastern European vampire is thought unable to touch the metal without suffering great wounds or death. These methods of burial are known as deviant burials and encompass a wide gamut of macabre ways in which to prevent the dead from rising. These deviant burials were carried out for a multitude of reasons, always, however, as a method of securing the dead beneath the ground. In his book, Vampire Forensics, historian Mark Colin Jenkins states the purpose of such practices quite clearly. In graves thousands of years old, skeletons have been found staked, tied up, buried, face down, decapitated, all well-attested ways of preempting the attacks of wandering corpses. In 1959, in southern Nottinghamshire, England, archaeologist Charles Daniels unearthed another unusual skeleton whilst excavating a site which had previously been known for the discovery of Roman remains. Dated to be from 550 to 700 AD, the skeleton had metal spikes driven through its shoulders, heart and ankles. Given that it dates from such an early period of history, Many archaeologists are not quick to attribute the burial with vampire traditions. Predating the earliest legends of vampirism in Europe by at least several hundred years, it's simply stated that the burial shows signs related to later vampiric burials and acts as both a curious anomaly and a warning to anyone who wishes to jump to a vampiric conclusion as an answer for deviant burials. Moving away from England and into the heartlands of Gothic folklore, during a 1966 excavation of a 10th to 11th century churchyard around 30 kilometers north of Prague, in Selikovice in the Czech Republic, the remains of 14 individuals were found which had undergone the treatment of deviant burial. Each body was buried in separate graves rather than mass burial. However, given the brief history that the graveyard was known to be used, shows that they all died within a similar time period. They were all young adults and both male and female. They were found with heavy rocks covering their bodies or spiked to the site with nails of varying lengths and metals. In 1991, during archaeological research being undertaken at the ancient church of the Holy Trinity in Prostejov, Slovakia, a 16th century crypt was discovered that entombed the remains of a man whose legs had been cut off at the knees, his body weighted with heavy stones. Just to be sure, he was then placed in a wooden coffin that was reinforced with thick iron bars. In 1994, archaeologist Hector Williams discovered the remains of an adult man on the Greek Isle of Lesbos. His tomb had been hollowed out of a solid stone wall and unlike the other bodies buried nearby who had been wrapped in cloth, he had been buried in a thick wooden coffin and then nailed into it with eight inch long spikes through his neck, pelvis and ankles. Interestingly in this case was also the discovery that the man was almost certainly a Muslim, making it the only non-Christian corpse found to date that was buried in such a manner. In 2005, in County Roscommon, Ireland, archaeologist Chris Reed discovered the bodies of two men buried side by side. One was of a man in his later years, probably between 50 and 60 years old, and the other was a young adult thought to be in his 20s. During their excavation of the site, 137 bodies were unearthed in total. However, Setting the two apart were large black stones jammed in their mouths and in one case with such force and the stone of such size that it almost dislocated the jaw entirely. The bodies dated from the 8th century which again placed them firmly before the times of popular vampire lore. However, Ireland has its own tales of revenants, remarkably similar to the vampires of the Balkans which could be attributed to the deviant burial. Similarly, in 2006, in Lazaretto Nuvo, Italy, two kilometers northeast of Venice, Italian archaeologist Matteo Borini, whilst excavating a plague pit used in the 16th and 17th centuries, found the skull of a mature female. 
The skull was dated to the 1576 Venetian plague, suggesting the victim had died of the disease. However, unlike the numerous other victims unceremoniously buried in the pit, she was found with a brick shoved into her mouth with such force that her teeth had all been broken. The same can be seen in the remains found in Kamien Pomorski, Poland, when in 2008, archaeologist Slavomir Gorka excavated a cemetery used periodically between the 13th and 18th centuries. Of the 275 sets of human remains that were excavated, six were found to be deviant burials dated to the 16th or 17th century. Five of the six had been buried with iron sickles placed across their abdomens, and in one case, a male that had been buried with its legs nailed to the ground, its teeth removed and a stone forced into its mouth. Such burials were attributed to vampires due to the legend that a vampire will feed from its burial shroud to awaken and reanimate after death. It was thought that by placing a brick, stone or wad of earth into the mouth, this could halt the process of returning as a vampire in its earliest stages. Taking this one step further, in 2013 on a building site next to a roadside in Gliwice, Poland, Four sets of remains were found dated to the 16th century, all of which had had their heads removed prior to the burial and placed between their legs. In Bulgaria in 2013, during an excavation nearby the ancient Thracian city of Perperikon, Nikolai Ovkrov unearthed the remains of a 40 to 50 year old man dated to the 13th century that had a piece of iron plow hammered through his chest with enough force to have broken his scapular bone. The following year, 2014, 200 miles to the east of Perperikon in the Black Sea town of Sozopol, two sets of male remains were uncovered thought to be from the 14th century. Both had heavy iron pieces of plough rammed through their chests in the same way as the remains in Perperikon. However, these men also had their left leg removed below the knee. The list of burials attributed to vampirism continues on and on. According to the head of the Bulgarian National Museum, Bozidar Dimitrov, there are 100 such burials, just like the example above, that have been discovered in Bulgaria alone. These are, of course, all archaeological finds of long dead persons, but there are stories too of living vampires who stalk through the night that date right up to modern times. Thanks for listening. Please like, subscribe and sleep tight.